Welcome to Understanding Buddhism in America, or UBA, as I like to call it. My name is Mike, and this week I'd like to thank all the people who've left reviews on iTunes for my podcast. So, here we go. Esther, Kevin, Maddie J, Bonerhead, <laughs> Brightgeist, Zia, Jatak, Chica, Alpine Kid, Yuli, G. Kruger, Laser, Camden, Biganate, Heather, Adrian, Brandelion, and Davin. You all have my thanks, love, and appreciation. I also want to thank Armin, Brandon, and Jesse for all emailing me about how much they like the show. And I've received a few comments and emails about the music I use at the beginning and the end of the shows. The instrument you hear is called a shakugachi. It's this kind of flute that's really, really, really incredibly difficult to get the hang of. And all the little music pieces you hear are actually me playing my shakugachi. And as you can tell, I'm not very good at it. I'm not. But it took me like six months just to get a single note out of it. So I'm definitely improving. If you don't like the music, you know, I could play guitar or mandolin or ukulele or I could just start rotating all of them. Why don't you just email me and tell me what you want to hear? Because it's way easier to give people what they want rather than to just guess it. So let me know. Today we're picking up on part two of the life and times of Buddha. Buddha strikes back! Uh, if you haven't listened to part one yet, this isn't going to make very much sense. So you should probably go back and do that right about now. Go. Go. Anyway, when we left off... Prince Siddhartha had decided on a life of spirituality and had just ninjaed out of the palace with his charioteer Chana, or Chandaka. There's like three names for everyone in every story in Buddhism due to all the language translations, so for now I'm just going to call him Sisi. <laughs> Sisi made a mean pizza. Uh, some say this was the moment when Mara, the mystical embodiment of self-deception, appeared to try and stop Siddhartha from leaving his old life. Now, there's a lot of mysticism in Buddhism, but it doesn't really matter if you believe in it wholeheartedly or not. Mara could easily just be considered symbolism for the prince's own emotions, which makes Buddha seem a bit more human to me, which I like. Sometimes the legends of Buddhism have so much mysticism in them, it can be almost hard to translate it all to reality. So, if you're having a hard time with Mara... Just do what I do, and imagine him as something funny, like the giant marshmallow guy from Ghostbusters. And I really doubt the Buddha would disapprove of this. Anyway, Marshmallow Mara, as I like to call him, tempted Siddhartha with the prophecy that if he stayed in his old life, he could rule the world. And he could begin ruling it like within the week. So Siddhartha immediately turned around, went home, and became ruler of the world. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. He was all like, whatever, whatever, I do what I want. And Mara decided to back off, but to follow the prince closely and wait for a moment of weakness. Sisi, who was still riding with Siddhartha while chowing down on his delicious pizza, was instructed to take his jewelry, clothes, crown, and horse and go back to the palace. Sisi thought this whole idea was nuts, so he tried to convince the prince otherwise, but Siddhartha wouldn't hear it. The prince took Cece's sword out to cut his own hair, he swapped clothes with a deer hunter, and then he told Cece to run home and tell everyone what had happened. Siddhartha instantly went from prince to beggar and started wandering around the world for the very first time. He quickly became accustomed to begging for food and sleeping on rocks and earth. While he was doing this, he was also starting to explore his spirituality. He traveled far and wide, well, he didn't have a horse, so realistically he probably only traveled close and thin. He was searching the land for the best spiritual teachers he could find. It seems like he didn't really plan this part out too well ahead of time, or maybe finding a teacher back then was a lot like finding a mechanic is today, because he didn't have much luck with mentors. The first mentor was a guy named Arada, and he was a pretty good teacher. Siddhartha memorized his doctrine and accomplished all of his meditation techniques really quickly, so Arada offered him the job to help him lead the community of people who lived with him. The former prince, however, felt discouraged. He was looking for a way out of suffering, and he still felt far from finding it. 
I like to imagine Siddhartha as a guy who left his career to become a mountain climber. Only the first mountain he ran into was Mount Rushmore. He wanted some Everest, and he wasn't getting very far by standing on the hair of Abraham Lincoln. So Siddhartha ventured off, giant marshmallow Mara still in tow, and found another guy, Rudraka Ramaputra, to teach him. I'm sure I'm still pronouncing all these names wrong, but I just, I just don't care anymore. Now, Ramaputra was a little more advanced than Arida, and had mastered one further technique of meditation. Siddhartha also quickly learned and mastered everything he had to say, essentially owning two of his land's best spiritual advisors in a very short time. That saying, third time's the charm, hadn't been invented yet, so the future Buddha decided to forget all these teachers. He was going solo. If you've ever seen the movie Little Buddha, this would be the part of the movie where Keanu Reeves puts his acting skills to the test by acting like a man acting like a tree. And that's about all you need to know from that movie. Uh, since the former prince ditched the idea of being a student, he looked to the local ascetics for inspiration. These were men who subjected themselves to extremes. They'd meditate in the hot sun within a circle of fire, while holding their breaths while not eating for days, while trying to forget every single Chuck Norris joke they ever learned in high school. It just wasn't easy. But Siddhartha shrugged and said, huh, well I guess anything's worth a shot. And he went for it. At the same time, the fact that he had just leveled up farther and faster than two of the region's most famous teachers started to spread around town. There was a man named Kondinya who believed that he was destined to be a Buddha and had been living homeless as well. He decided he should try and find this ascetic ASAP. With him were his four homeless friends that I'd really like to believe he referred to as his hobros. Their names were Ashvajit, Vashpa, Mahanaman, and Bradrika. For the sake of time and giggles, I'm going to call them Ashi, the Flying V, Mano Man, and Bra. These four guys and their friend Kondinya, who I'm now calling Katie, decided to become students to this legendary ascetic. Later, a famous burger joint may or may not have been named in honor of these five guys. Okay, it definitely wasn't, but it's still kind of a nice thought. They basically just ended up helping Siddhartha do his own thing anyway. They helped him drink, bathe, and stand whenever he got weak. As weak as he was, he continued to practice this way for six years. At this point, Siddhartha was getting suspicious about the ascetic life being able to produce any good results, so he decided to try and up his food intake by eating one meal a day. Yeah, that was a step up for him. Legend has it that before that moment, he was eating just one grain of rice a day. Now, Ashy, the Flying V, man o man Bra, and Katie weren't very happy with this decision. For six years, they had been servants to this guy in the hopes that his practice would make him a Buddha. Even one peanut meant he was giving up on his practice. And now he had a mouthful of breakfast. So they felt like they had just wasted all those years for nothing. Siddhartha, on the other hand, was actually getting healthy again. And didn't look so much like that skeleton my teacher had in high school biology. The five guys finally abandoned Siddhartha when he wandered to a nearby river, where a girl named Sujata fed him some rice and milk that tasted so good, he could have sworn it was Cheddar Bay Biscuits. Apparently, milk was the last straw for the five guys. I mean, Siddhartha didn't even dunk in a cookie or have it with cereal or anything. He just drank it straight, with rice. What a crazy man. Siddhartha eventually regained his strength, which I'm sure included some Kill Bill-style toe-wiggling, and decided he was going to try, once and for all, to reach enlightenment. The end of suffering. He walked across the river sat on a cushion of grass, and resolved to not move from his seat until he was enlightened, even if it meant his death. It was then that Marshmallow Mara, or Siddhartha's self-deception, decided the time had come to attack. Carefully, Siddhartha began examining his confused mind. He felt fear, doubt, anxiety, and probably a number of other emotions, but he looked them all over, one by one, and let them all go. Some say this is when Marshi Mara decided to attack the former prince. At that moment, he essentially was the marshmallow guy from Ghostbusters, 
if you can imagine New York City as symbolism for Siddhartha's mind. Marshi Mara was really starting to cause a ruckus. He, or it, tried confusing and tempting Siddhartha in every way possible. Some say Mara tempted him with food, women, and power. Some say he raised an entire army to influence Siddhartha's mind. And when his archers shot their arrows towards the future Buddha, they simply fell to the ground as flowers. So, if you get flowers from someone, they could be saying that they like you or that they're in love with you. Or they could be saying they really wanted to kill you, but for whatever reason, they just couldn't. Uh, usually, I've gathered, it's the former, but you never really know. Now, a lot of people have asked me how long Siddhartha meditated for. Uh, it's another one of those answers that changes depending on who you ask. Some say it was seven weeks. Some say it was one night. But most agree that it doesn't really matter. Chances are, he probably lost track of time himself. But whatever the duration, he was a Buddha now. He awakened into a walking, talking, lean, mean, enlightened machine. Buddha decided the time had come for him to travel back to his roots. And at the age of 35, he began his journey back to his home. I'm going to stop here for today, but I want to ask everyone listening to send me an email this week or next week with a question in it. My next podcast will be part three, Return of the Buddha. But the one after that, I want to turn into a question and answer type of podcast. So everyone send in all your questions. I don't care if it's about Buddhism or the podcast or me personally or just something random like why is the sky blue? I don't care. Send me anything. I will answer it on the air, uh, not next week, but the week after. And you can email me with your shout outs, questions or comments at understanding buddhism in america at gmail.com thanks for listening and i'll see you next time for the epic conclusion to the story of buddha <laughs> <laughs>